welcome back. We're back at statistics, path 140, and we're talking about graphical displays of data. Before I get started now, I'm going to do my job and pick up a pen here so I can say things like hi. Alright, so we're talking about a lot of things about graphical ways of describing data and here are just some small things, or some large things I guess, depending on how you put it. Things that graphs should have like titles, labels on axes, things that you need if you like actually looking at a graphical display of some data. If you don't have a title, you don't immediately get the idea of what the graph is for. You need the labels of that on the axis so you can tell what does the vertical part mean, what does the horizontal part mean, and where does all this come from, and maybe something about the data itself. So all we're talking about is we're talking about a picture of the data. An infographic is another way of putting it. And the legend is a description of how the data category is identified in the graph. We're not going to make a big deal about some of these things. To be honest, you're most likely to create this with something like Excel or some kind of a statistical program like RGuru or well, there are all kinds of things that you can choose. And some of them are free. If you've already got Excel, you've got a great pie chart maker, for example. You can see what some of the pie charts look like. See the red mark there, red arrow there? There's the pie chart. Now, these are basically what... Let's talk about Excel, for example. This is what Excel is going to do for you when you use Excel to create a pie chart. Notice on the right of our frequency chart here, we've got frequencies for each of these categories. Oops, that's total. This will, of course, be 100%. 40 items. And the way it's created is you create the relative frequencies. We'll talk about that. Each frequency divided by the total gives you a decimal, which can be converted to a percent, which can also be converted to how much of the circle does that represent. And that's how you get the degrees. So take the relative frequency, either the percent or the decimal itself, multiply by 360, and you could create your parts pie chart if you were doing it by hand, which no one in their right mind is going to do, right? So, that's what it would look like, because the apartments were 50%, the dorm 25%, and so on. You can see that with the pie chart. Pie chart is a great way of showing some, some percentages with categories. And you have your option inside Excel, for example, to put the name of the category here, the part of it here, usually a percent. Sometimes you'll put the category out here, along with a percent. And why would you do that? Well, if your category is real small like this, you might not have room inside there to put the name of the category and the percentage. So you can read that yourself. Hit on pause and this will give you an idea what Excel is doing in the background for you. Remember, I'm talking about Excel generically as some kind of a, a spreadsheet, for example, something that will hold the data and then do all the heavy work for you. There's the completed one. And you can see the percentages. And of course, if you want to, you can look back at your frequency chart. And there's would be the decimals. 
Each one of those is multiplied by 360 degrees, and you figure out from that how large that section needs to be. It's as easy as that. Not only that, but something like Excel is also going to fill in this nice colors for you. And remember, you can change the colors too. One, one last time I'll mention it, I think the last time, is that if this section is too small, suppose you had a sector that was that small, there's no way you're going to get some information like that inside it. So you take it outside, if necessary. It's nice to have it inside, though. That's why your infographic doesn't get too big. And if you want to do it in those, you can look at thestat.hawkstarring.com and that will give you an idea of how to use Excel. I would suggest trying one or two. You could actually use the numbers we had a few minutes ago. See if you can do it in Excel using those instructions. You probably only would need to do it once or twice. And if, for example, you work part-time somewhere and your boss needed an infographic, he said he might, he or she might say, you're taking statistics now, aren't you? Could you make us this pie chart? We really need a pie chart to show the investors. You might be able to do it. And get a bonus, who knows? Bar graph uses bars. Notice that you have to connect these two things. A bar graph is when the data comes in categories, not in numbers. Oops, too far. And there's our data. Notice that these are categories. We don't have numbers there. And the numbers are just counts. That's what we get from categories. And we can skip over that, except there, there's a picture of a bar graph. Notice one thing about this bar graph. Notice with a bar graph that these individual parts of the graph do not meet. They're side by side but they don't actually, the bars don't actually touch. Very important. Bar graph, the pieces don't touch. A histogram, they do touch. Keep that in mind. Another chance to try it in Excel. Hopefully you tried it in with a pie chart. Now try it with a bar chart. Good experience. A burrito chart. This does, does, does sound like something that you would do for a business or something where you really need to highlight what's the most frequent item on your list and what's the least frequent. So, of course, with any business, you have a certain budget. Suppose your budget would only allow you to put some money toward one item. You have to figure out which item is the most important. Using a Pareto chart, you'll have a bar chart that looks a bit like this. Remember, they don't touch. And each one of those bars is the same size or smaller than the last one. They go downhill, basically. That's a Pareto chart. Descending order for the part Pareto chart. So here's how you create it. Notice the numbers. Notice there's a high and there's a low. So when you're creating a Pareto chart, this would come first, this would come last, Let's see, this one would be second and 
frequency chart and there's a bar chart and this is one way of putting it this one is horizontal so the first one is longest the next one's not quite as long the next one's shorter but shorter all the way down you could also do this and swap the two axes the first one has the longest height the next one the next longest Shorter, shorter, shorter. Highest, lowest. Try that in Excel. Many tabs know the possibility, but there's a good chance that you don't have access to many tabs, so we're going to just ignore that. Side by side is another possibility. So you've got what amounts to two frequency distributions here. The frequency distribution here, and you've got frequency distribution that matches up those two columns. They can be very interesting to put side by side. And the side by side will look like this. You've got both classes for apartments, both classes for dorms. A legend out here, so you can tell which is which. You've got along the bottom. You've got a legend, or excuse me, a listing of what the horizontal axis is, what the vertical axis is, and so on. You can make choices depending on what you see in that side by side. You get multiple samples of data. It doesn't have to be just two, it could be two, three, four even. Probably not too many though. And a stacked graph looks a little bit different. Take that same data, create our stacked one, and it would look like this. For each category, you'd have like we have here, the freshmen and the sophomores. You put the fresh, freshman here, because that's pretty hard to see. And the sophomore here, freshman here, sophomores there, and so on. Don't mix them up. I don't think Excel would even let you do something like that. You can see the purpose of that. You can see the proportions of those in each of those categories. Now the histogram, remember it's like a bar chart except the bars are actually, actually going to touch. So here's some data in the histogram. Do you remember how to create the classes? Here we go. Do you remember how to create the classes? I mean, the class with the number of classes and all that. How to get the frequencies. How to get a midpoint, which is halfway between those two. And the class boundary, so you have no gaps. Remember also I gave you an extra tip that in this class, goes from 49, 999.5, up to, but not including, the last number. So if you use algebra notation, interval notation, be from the first number up to, but not including the second one. And that works for all the classes. So when you're looking at your data and deciding which class they belong in, there are no gaps. And no duplications either. Next, a histogram look like this. Notice the bars are touching. That's because there are no gaps. 
because from here to here, this number touches both of those categories. Try that with Excel. Just once. Next, just a reminder the histogram, note the horizontal axis number line and bars touch a histogram looks like a bar graph but a histogram has the bars touching because there are no gaps With the category you have a jump from each category to the next frequency histogram that's the one we just showed where each height is in whatever the hist whatever the frequency is for that particular category a relative frequency histogram instead of using the frequencies for each category use the relative frequency for each category now what you'll notice if you actually try this if you create a frequency histogram and a relative frequency histogram, you'll notice that the shapes are exactly the same. The proportions are exactly the same. So it's up to you which way you want to show it. Maybe you want to show the numbers in each category. So use a frequency histogram. Maybe you want to show the percentages in each category. So relative frequency might be your choice. So you could take these numbers, these classes, notice you've got the frequency, so you can create a frequency histogram, or take the last column and create a relative frequency histogram. If you've got a really good eye for it, and I'm not sure that I can do that without some work, but if you look at, just for example, if you look at this, three and the twelve percent just for example and then you jump down here to the ten which is the biggest one and the forty percent notice that the forty percent is also the biggest percentage notice that since ten is three and a third times as much as three if you start with twelve percent three and a third times that is 40%. All the proportions are going to be exactly the same. There's what it looks like, what it looks like as a relative frequency histogram. If you slide back, I'm not going to jump back because I don't have an easy way to jump back there. If you jump back and look at the frequency histogram, it looks the same, really you'll get the same conclusions look at either one. So it just depends on what you would like. If you want the percentages out here, then this is your guide. If you want the actual numbers represented by the height, then this would be not, not your choice, but you have frequencies out here instead. Two more that are rather interesting. One of the things that I'll tell you about the stem and leaf plot is that one advantage is after you have the picture for the stem and leaf plot, you still got the data. So if someone lost the page that had all the original data in it, the stem and leaf plot would still have all those data, as we'll see in a minute. The ordered stem and leaf plot just means you're going to take them from one end to the other, like descending or ascending order. So you create two columns, and you can see that when we get to an example here. So this is sort of what it looks like. The largest digit goes here, and the subsidiary digits go there. For example, what does this number mean right here? Well, this being the stem, 
means that if you look at this 4, it represents a 14. So if you look at this number right here, go with the stem first, this represents a 35. If you look at this number, it would be a 26. All the data are actually still there in the stem and leaf plot. Now this isn't the way you show it though. We'll show that in a minute. Here's, here's some data. And you might notice, first of all, that they're a bit jumbled. No one was nice enough to put them in order for you. But we'll get something special going to describe this data. Notice they're all two-digit numbers. Sneak back here for a second. They're all in the teens, the twenties, and the thirties. That's the clue. So since it's the teens, twenties, and thirties, your stems will be one for the teens, two for the twenties, three for the thirties. Here's how you set it up. The various stems go here. Now this is not part of the stem and leaf block. Forget that for the time being. The stems go here in order, and you can just go to your data, your original data, say, okay, I want the teens. I see there's an 18 in the original data, so one goes here, and the eight goes there. So these two together tell you that 18 was part of the original data. The one with the nine means 19 was the original part of the data. Notice that there's another 18, another 18, and a 17 for this layer or this stem of the stem and leaf plot. Down here, you put these numbers because you saw a 23, so it goes with the 20s, and you put the 3 here, a shortened version of 23, because you know the first digit is 2, second digit is 3. The second digit goes here, and the first digit tells you what the stem is. Notice that 3, 4, 7, 6, they aren't in order. That's okay. What you want is for each of these numbers, 8 and a 3, 9 and a 4, 8 and a 7, and so on out, that they be nice and evenly spaced. That way, when you finish your stem and leaf plot like this, you can see that there are twenties because this this bunch of leaves goes out further. There are more in the twenties, and there's more th more teens than there are thirties. So if you're looking at this and trying to make a decision, that might be important. As I said, you notice. These numbers right here are not in order. If you put them here in order, then that's an ordered stem and leaf plot. I think we'll see an example here coming up. So you can easily see the largest and smallest salaries, which one appears the most often. How I many salaries were in the 40s, and so on. So here's an example for those entry-level accountants. The stem in this case is in tens of thousands. Now this one it wouldn't have made as much sense, and you can try it in various ways. You could have gone with just a stem of four, and stem of five, and there are no sixes, so we leave that out. This is the key. It should be all separately somewhere, or in a different color. That wouldn't tell you much. You'd have a bunch here and a bunch there. However, using two digits for the stem, you can see how various levels are. You'll notice also that these 
are in order, the leaves are in order, 74, 9, 5, 7, 9, 0, 2. So this is an ordered stem and leaf plot because the leaves come in order with each stem. Another option, making a stem and leaf plot. Remember, one of the big advantages to a stem and leaf plot, even though it looks maybe on the crude side, it does still have all the data showing. So if you want to resurrect the, data, the original data, there it is, right in front of you. Just as a reminder, if we take this number right here, what was the original piece of data? Well, 4, 8, 3. 4, 8, 3. 483, or in this case, since it's tens of thousands of dollars, 4, 8 with a 3 out here would represent $48,300 as a starting salary for those accountants. And you can find out all this information just by looking at the stem and leaf plot. Now we're looking at next the percentage, percentage of the population that are under 5 years old. So, if you wanted to start a children's clothing boutique, you would hope to find the area of the country that had a large percentage of under five-year-olds. Here is a heat map, and this is colored to give you a quick idea of where the percentages of this population are since you want to sell as many children's clothing items as possible, you want to make sure you can get into those states. And those are mentioned here with a dark blue, very dark blue. And so you'd want to be in Idaho, you'd want to be in Utah, you'd want to be in the mid, mid Midwest for sure, and Indiana, Maryland, See, Maryland goes all the way down here. This is the eastern shore. And, of course, Georgia, not far away. Oh, excuse me. Georgia would be a good place to go, but it's not quite as concentrated with under five-year-olds. Alaska, though, missed that. And I'm not sure what this color is. I don't think it's the dark blue. So I guess it depends on whether you want to have a store in Hawaii, just to go there and visit occasionally on vacation. That's up to you. You're the one that owns the business. Read through that, please. I'm not going to read through you. I know you can read. Okay, coming close to the end. We've also got a dot, dot plot. Another very simple one that also keeps your numbers the heat map you just saw where you have different colors for different categories or percentages. We also have line graphs. You're very familiar with those. Can you want a consumer price index? I knew what it was a long time ago, but I didn't really appreciate how some of this worked until I sort of accidentally taught a class that included the Consumer Price Index. You might find it interesting to read up a little bit on how the Consumer Price Index works, and also how you can compare the Consumer Price Index from, say, 1970 to 2016. It's not really hard, and it's interesting. Here's an example of Constructing a line graph. This is one you should be familiar with. A line graph, of course, looks something like this. It's like a polynomial if you know your algebra pretty well. Notice you've got years for categories, consumer price index for the values. I noticed that 1970, I just mentioned, that was. Not quite by accident. That's one of those base years that the statistics go by. 
So if you're going to draft this, almost every single time, if one of these values represents a year, like the year does, the time is all, almost always going to be all the horizontal axis. So keep that in mind. And that way, when you draw your picture, this is time rolling from yesterday to today to tomorrow. And you can see what the consumer price index is doing as those years go by. I made that up, of course. And that, again, that's a good one to use with Excel. And there's a picture for you. You can see how it's going up pretty steadily, actually. Now, if we stretch that out a bit, it might not look quite so constant, but it is fairly constant. That means that the, the price of eggs, for example, compared to all the rest, is going up at the same rate. Now the Consumer Price Index, just for your information, is a value they get by taking a lot of different products. Maybe diapers, maybe the price of tea, cars, all kinds of things that people buy, put them together in one big lump, lump one big barrel, and create the Consumer Price Index, and you're comparing it with a base year. How expensive were those items in base year, compared to how expensive those items are in the year you're interested in. And that's pretty much how it works. I would suggest, especially with this Consumer Price Index, you might want to try that too. Get those numbers, get an Excel, all the directions there, Enjoy your craft. Well, that's it for graphical representations of data. I hope this wasn't too long. And I'll see you next time in section 2.3. Until then, bring your questions to class and we'll have a good chat. Bye bye for now.